Lawrence's first letter of 1923 addresses a familiar theme, finance. He reassures the artist Jan Jutta, who illustrated Sea and Sardinia, we both get some money, but not a great deal. And then a couple of sentences later, dismisses artists and Taos, who paint purely in terms of dollars. Lawrence seems quite motherly towards Robert Mountsier when he comes to visit. He hopes the break will enable him to settle down to ranch life and forget literary agency for the time being. But by the time Mountsier leaves on the 28th of January, Lawrence is glad to see the back of him. But more of that in our next video. In terms of writing, lots of loose ends are starting to come together. The December issue of The Laughing Horse turns up, which includes his review of Fantasius Malari. He's not content to merely finish writing Birds, Beast and Flowers, but instead wants to know about the intended format of the book, what size it will be, what decoration it will include, details he expects to be given exactly. In terms of studies in classic American literature, Seltzer is given precise instructions. If you want anything altered or eliminated, tell me the page and line. Despite this productive period of writing, he is becoming increasingly frustrated with Martin Secker, the London publisher who he distrusts because he isn't publishing his books quickly enough. When not writing and reviewing, he's busy working on translations of Giovanni Verga, which will be published in the collection Little Novels of Sicily. Lawrence would have related to many of the themes in Verga's sketches, not least the class struggle between property owners and tenants, evocative descriptions of the landscape, and man's changing relationship with it. All of this will be enough for most writers, but Lawrence is not like other writers. He wants to know more about the 1888 copyright laws between Italy and America, and is pitching artwork on behalf of Gocci to the Dial to illustrate his essay Taos, which will be published in March 1923. Perhaps because he spent so much time focused on literary matters, he expected his literary connections to help him with domestic issues. Adele Seltzer is tasked with sending Frida some underwear. <laughs> the most interesting letter of January is to Thomas Seltzer, which reports that Pips, a French bull terrier given to Lawrence by Mabel Dodge Stern, got well spanked, and so he has gone to live with the Danes. There let her stay. She's got no loyalty. This incident would cause great controversy when Nud Merrill recounted it in his memoir, A Poet and Two Painters, but it was vociferously rebuked in the editorial of the local Taos paper in 1937. I never saw him ill-treat anything except a teapot and some cups, scolded Dorothy Brett. Lawrence's fits of rage were phenomenal, wrote Spud Johnson but I never saw him anything but gentle and affectionate with animals. And on and on the letters went. The Danes offer good company in the evenings, as Merold has a flute and Gochi a fiddle. Eager to keep the vibe going, Lawrence requests Adele Seltzer send him a copy of the Oxford Songbook. At least up in the mountains, with Tell Station 43 miles away, there are no nosy neighbours to report them to the police for singing suspicious lyrics, as had happened when the Lawrences lived in Cornwall during World War I. Despite the isolation, Lawrence continued to be the focus of gossip. Mabel Dodge Stern had been chiding the locals. I had to get rid of the Lawrences. He is furious and vows... I will never see her again. It's no wonder then that he wanted to embrace the solitudes of the mountains, 
while he could. I want to be alone, as much alone as I am while I am here. <laughs>